Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. The time for convening has arrived. The Senate will now come to order. At this time, I ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. Recognize the senator from the 28th for a reading of the journal. Good morning, Mr. President. I thought we were going to reconsider some stuff before we read the journal. After, okay, got it. All right, well, we got a long day, Mr. President. I've got a long list of pages, so I'm going to jump right in it. Out of Lake Spivey, we have Austin Edmondson. Out of McDonough, we have Sophie Zetto. Out of Dallas, we have Emily Smith. Out of Noonan, we have my neighbor, Weber Beam. Also out of Noonan, we have Kevin Huff. Another one out of Noonan, Hampton Keith. Another one out of Noonan, Preston Lewis. I've been promoting it. Also out of Grantville, which is right down the street from Noonan, we have Jones McBriar. Out of Decatur, we have Sonoma Oster. Out of Hull, we have Reginald Hughes and Noah Spear. Out of McDonough, we have Katie Hudgens. Out of Woodstock, we have Harrison Honeycutt. Out of Woodstock, we have Asher McCullum. Out of, also out of Woodstock, we have Jack Rybold. Out of Grayson, we have Grant Cooper. Out of Decatur, we have Evie Owens. Out of Ambrose, we have Addison Taylor. Out of Douglas, we have Lacey Spears. Out of Braxton, we have Layla Varnado. And then out of Locust Grove, we have brother and sister Lamar and Tara, Taraji Johnson. Did I say it right, Taraji? I got it close. Y'all give our pages a big round of applause. We look forward to working with y'all today. We got a full, full agenda, so plenty of work to be had. Mr. President, the journal has been read and found to be correct. All right, thank you, Senator, and, and we always appreciate our pages being here today. We've got another big crowd today. I think today might be a little longer than what some of the other pages have uh, seen in the past, so congratulations today. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading of the journal? The chair hears none, the reading of the journal is dispensed with. Are there any motions to reconsider? I recognize the senator from the 18th. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate reconsider its action in failing to pass HB 1114. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 1114, a bill by Representative Wade of the 9th and others, a bill to be taught an act to amend Title 33 of the OCGA relating to insurance so as to enact the Data Analysis for Tort Reform Act to provide for definitions, to provide for applicability, to provide for data collection from certain insurers, insurance rating organizations, and state agencies, to provide for confidentiality, to provide for data analysis, to provide for reports, to provide for automatic repeal, and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Walker of the 20th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection? Without objection. The, the bill is reconsidered and goes on to the rules calendar. I recognize Senator from the 56 for a motion. Isn't it? Mr. President, I move the Senate reconsider its action uh, in House Bill 808. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 808, 
a bill by Representative Chokas of the 151st and others, a bill to be town enact to amend Article 2 of Chapter 5 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to property tax exemptions and deferral, so as to increase a statewide ad valorem tax exemption for tangible personal property and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Finance recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Huff Settler of the 52nd District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection? Without objection, the House Bill 808 will be moved to the foot of the rules calendar. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Hearing none, the journal is confirmed. First reading references of Senate bills and resolutions. Secretary? Senate Bill 586 by Senator McLaurin of the 14th and others, a bill to be entitled to amend Article Judiciary. 2. Judiciary. Senate Bill 587 by Senator Bearden of the 30th and others, a bill to be entitled to amend Code Section 16. Judiciary. Senate Resolution 826 by Senator Oreck of the 36th and others, a resolution creating the Senate Saving Georgia's Pollinator Study Rules. Committee. That completes the order, Mr. President. First reading references of House bills. House Bill 1473 by Representative Stinson of the 150th. State and local government. House Bill 1474 by Representative Lupton State of the 83rd. And local government. House Bill 1475 by Representative Fleming of the 114th. State and local government. House Bill 1476 by Representative McDonald of the 26th. State and, and other. local government. House Bill 1477 by Representative Fleming of the 114th. State and local government. House Bill 1479 by Representative Burchett of the 170th. State and local government. House Bill 1480 by Representative Silcox of the 53rd and others. State and local government. House Bill 1481 by Representative Cannon of the 58th. State 58. local government. House Bill 1482 by Representative Stevens of the 164th. State 64. local government. House Bill 1485 by Representative Lupton of the 83rd and others. A bill to be telling local government. House Bill 1486 by Representative Lupton of the 83rd. State and local government. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read reports of standing committee. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Appropriations has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Resolution 302 do pass by substitute, House Resolution 1042 do pass by substitute, House Bill 916 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Tillery of the 19th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Education and Youth has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Resolution 692 do pass, House Bill 338 do pass by substitute, House Bill 846 do pass by substitute, House Bill 409 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 298 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Dixon of the 45th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Ethics has had under consideration a foreign legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 976 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Burns of the 23rd District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Finance has had under consideration the foreign legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 1021 do pass, House Bill 1180 do pass by substitute. House Bill 1182 do pass by substitute, House Bill 264 do pass by substitute, House Resolution 96 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 1116 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Huff Settler of the 52nd District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services has added under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the Senate back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 1037 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 1314 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Watson of the 1st District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Higher Education has added under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Senate Resolution 770 do pass, House Bill 1231 do pass by substitute, House Bill 56 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Hickman of the 4th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor has added under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 451 do pass by substitute, House Bill 495 do pass by 945 do pass and House Bill 384 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Walker of the 20th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Judiciary has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 470 do pass by substitute, House Bill 505 do pass by substitute, House Bill 1075 do pass, House Bill 1371 do pass by substitute, House Bill 231 do pass by substitute, House Bill 1247 do pass by substitute, House Bill 881 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 508 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. 
Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Public Safety has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 348 do pass by substitute, House Bill 959 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 498 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Rules has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Resolution 37 do pass, Senate Resolution 123 do pass, Senate Resolution 152 do pass, Senate Resolution 156 do pass, Senate Resolution 203 do pass, Senate Resolution 251 do pass, Senate Resolution 286 do pass, Senate Resolution 392 do pass, Senate Resolution 634 do pass, Senate Resolution 718 do pass, Senate Resolution 786 do pass, House Bill 625 do pass by substitute, and House Bill 814 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Brass of the 28th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on State and Local Governmental Operations Local has had an consideration of the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 567 do pass, Senate Bill 579 do pass, House Bill 1327 do pass, House Bill 1399 do pass, House Bill 1425 do pass, House Bill 1436 do pass, House Bill 1438 do pass, House Bill 1462 do pass, House Bill 1463 do pass. House Bill 1466 do pass, House Bill 1467 do pass, House Bill 1468 do pass, House Bill 1483 do pass, and Senate Bill 584 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on State and Local Governmental Operations has added under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 1454 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on State and Local Government Relations General has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 1061 do pass, House Bill 1062 do pass, and House Bill 1067 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator again of the 47th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read bills and resolutions for the second time. Senate Resolution 152 by Senator Ron Miller V and others. Egyptian American Day recognized February 23rd, 2023. Senate Resolution 156 by Senator Andrew Chart today with the 31st and others. Technical College System of Georgia licensed truck drivers provide streamlined training for commercial motor vehicle operation urge. Senate Resolution 392 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others. Seidel Laura Turner recognized. Senate Resolution 634 by Senator Summers of the 13th and others. United States government opposed further enabling the World Health Organization or Senate Resolution 692 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others. Senate Transportation Student Safely Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 718 by Senator Rahman of the 5th and others. Dr. Indran B. In Brockington Day, recognized February 20th, 2024. Senate Resolution 770 by Senator Harrell of the 40th and others. Senate Higher Education in Prison Study Committee create. House Bill 56 by Representative Petrie of the 166 and others. Education grants to children of law enforcement officers, firefighters, and prison guards killed in the line of duty provisions. House Bill 231 by Representative Gullett of the 19th and others. Prosecuting Attorneys Oversight Commission create. House Bill 409 by Representative Daniel of 170. 117th and others, local government authorized local authorities to dispose of real property in the same manner as counter government authorities. House Bill 14, 451 by Representative Seabock of the 34th and others. Public officers and employees supplemental illness specific insurance for certain first responders with occupational post traumatic stress disorder require provision. House Bill 505 by Representative Chokas of the 151st and others. Crimes and offenses riot provide for a felony penalty. House Bill 846 by Representative Leverett of the 123rd. Education require local school systems to annually notify employees whether social security taxes will be withheld from their pay and eligibility of certain benefits. House Bill 881 by Representative Gullet of the 19th and others. Prosecuting Attorneys Qualifications Commission. Standards of Conduct and Rules Revisions. House Bill 916 by Representative Burns of the 159th and others. General Appropriations State Fiscal Year July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. House Bill 945 by Representative Hawkins of the 27th and other state employees health insurance plan protection for covered persons when an in-network hospital becomes an out-of-network prior to the end of the year provide. 
House Bill 959 by Representative Corbett of the 174th and others, motor vehicles for future for passing stationary vehicles on certain highways provide. House Bill 976 by Representative Lohood of the 175th and others, elections, ballots used in optical scan voting systems shall use paper with a visible watermark security feature provide. House Bill 1021 by Representative Dan of the 117th and others, income tax increase amount of dependent exemption. House Bill 1037 by Representative Daniel of the 117th and others, Georgia Commission on Maternal and Infant Health Create. House Bill 1061 by Representative Lumsden of the 12th Somerville City of Living and Excise Tax. House Bill 1062 by Representative Lumsden of the 12th Chattooga County Living and Excise Tax. House Bill 1067 by Representative Lumsden of the 12th Tryon Town of Levy and Excise Tax. House Bill 1075 by Representative Hilton of the 48th and others. Notaries public state agencies shall accept certain notarial facts performed in another state provide. House Bill 1116 by Representative Buckner of the 137th and others. Income tax credit rehabilitation of historic structures. Home portion extends sunset date. House Bill 1180 by Representative Carpenter of the 4th and others, income tax credit, film, gaming, video, and or digital production revise a definition. House Bill 1182 by Representative Crow of the 118th and others, income tax, in low income housing tax credits revise. House Bill 1231 by Representative Holcomb of the 81st, post secondary education allow academically successful students to use the full number of hours of Hope Scholarship eligibility. House Bill 1247 by Representative Lover of the 123rd and others, provide for transfer on debt deeds. House Bill 1314 by Representative Roman of the 97th and others held to designate emergency medical services including ambulance service as an essential service. House Bill 1371 by Representative Virtue of the 176 towards clarify liability regarding third party criminal activities provisions. House Resolution 96 by Representative Williams of the 148th and others at Valerum tax rate reduction for sale or harvest of timber provide constitutional amendment. House Resolution 302 by Representative Camp of the 135th and others, General Assembly appropriation of funds received from certain legal judgments or settlements provide constitutional amendment. House Resolution 1042 by Representative Lever of the 123rd and others, Joint Study Committee on Judicial System Compensation, create. That completes the order, Mr. President. It is now time for the morning roll call. And and I want to get everybody's attention real quick before we have the morning roll call. The, we don't, we have, we have, we have zero presentations today. And you, know, you, you can clap to that if you want to. We have zero presentations. I want everybody to listen very closely to this because I know that inevitably there'll be somebody who come up here and they'll get, you know, get their feelings hurt. But, and we're going to strictly abide by the per points of personal privilege today. We have three minutes of po uh, per points of personal privilege. And I both told the majority leaders and the minority leaders that at the end of three minutes, we're cutting the mics off. So if, if, if y'all hadn't learned how to make a point in, five min in three minutes by now, y'all get out of politics anyways. But uh, I, so, it's no, so I'm not taking a direct shot at any individual. We just can't have, we can't have the, long, the presentations going 10 or 15 minutes like they have been for, for the last week and a half. So that's, that's the deal for here on out because we got a lot of bills on the docket and we got to try to get through a uh, majority of them if we can. And so anyway, so please be brief if you can, be brief. All right, I don't mind, we don't mind how many are lined up to talk, but we want to keep it within three minutes. So, all right. Any motions to excuse? No. Recognize the senator from the 43rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senators from the 5th, 38th, and 33rd, and the 2nd. Without objection, the Senators from the 5th, the 38th, 33rd, and 22nd? Or the 2nd, no. excuse me. 2nd. Second. Second. Excuse. Two. Recognize. Thank you. Any other motions to excuse? Senator from the 6th. Mr. President, unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 41st for business outside of the Capitol. Without, without objection. No objection, Senator from the 41st at school. Recognize Senator from the 40th. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senators from the 55th and the 42nd. 55th and 42nd, without objection, they are excused. 
Senator from 36, you wishing to Nobody. Any other motions? Secretary will call the roll. Senator, signify your presence by voting the yay switch. Secretary will unlock the machines. It is now time for our morning devotion. All senators take your seats and cease all audible conversation. I would ask that the doorkeeper secure the chamber at this time. I now recognize the senator from the 28th, lead us in our pledge and introduce our chaplain of the day. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, please join me in honoring our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance. And now join me in honoring our Georgia flag. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag, the principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, moderation, and courage. Friends, it gives me great honor to introduce our pastor today, Dr. David Hughes. Um, David accepted the call to the senior pastor of First Baptist Church, Carrollton, in January of 2022. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish at Furman University, a Master of Divinity from Erskine Theological Seminary, and a Doctor of Ministry at McAfee School of Theology in Church Leadership and Administration in 2023. Before accepting the call to ministry in 2011, David worked for six years for nonprofits in Greenville, South Carolina, and Patagonia, Chile. Previously, he served as the minister to students at First Baptist Church of Augusta and Easley First Baptist Church. Married to Rebecca in 2006, David's amazing wife is a constant source of love, encouragement, and partnership in the ministry. Two of them welcomed their daughter Maggie in 2012 and now watch with amazement as their precious daughter continues to grow and develop. Please help me welcome Dr. David Hughes. Senators and others present who represent the great state of Georgia. Today, I invite you to consider the word desire. I want to contend with you today that desire is something that drives us all as human beings, no matter our creed or belief system. Your presence here today represents that you all share in desire. You desire to hold office. You desire to serve others, to participate in a great democracy, to strive together so that we might become a more perfect union. These are great outcomes of desire. Yet my question today is, where will you find fulfillment of your ultimate desire? The triumphal entry is a moment that the church recognized is as the beginning of Holy Week on a day entitled Palm Sunday. As described by the Gospels, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem with great fanfare. Palm branches are waved, hailing him as victor. Coats are laid at his feet, showing great honor. Voices rise up, exclaiming, Hosanna. Such was the commotion that the attention of several Greeks visiting that city were enthralled. It spoke to a desire within, something that the Greeks believed was an indelible part of their being. Plato, the father of Greek philosophy, talks about this desire. 
We are fired into madness that comes from the gods and which would have us believe that we can have great love, perpetuate our own seed, and con contemplate the divine. Plato acknowledges the great force of desire shared by Greeks. However, he also acknowledges that their concept of desire provided no final fulfillment. This is why the interaction that follows between Jesus and the Greeks after the triumphal entry is of specific interest. Sir, they said, speaking to a disciple, we would like to see Jesus. After these Greeks were presented to Jesus, he begins to teach about how desires are ultimately fulfilled. Jesus said, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In this statement, Jesus gives insight into how a person can be driven by desire, but ultimately never find fulfillment of it. Jesus would say, if life is only about the pursuit of your desires, you simply love yourself too much. It is self-idolatry. The tragedy of such a life driven only by the pursuit of your desire is that ultimately it kills you emotionally and spiritually. That's why Jesus offers a different way. Die to the sole pursuit of your own desire and live to fulfill the desire of others. So strong must this desire be that you will hate your own desires by comparison. But in so doing, you will find yourself pleasing to God and living for eternity. I know this was confusing for the Greeks, and it's confusing to us also. And that's why Jesus would practice what he preached. Days later, he himself wrestled with the pursuit of his own desire versus that of his heavenly father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. In other words, Jesus is saying, God, I don't want to die on a cross, but if my death means that the desires of all humanity can be fulfilled because their relationship with you will be fully restored, then let it be about your desire and not mine. Aren't we thankful for such a sacrifice? I close with this final exercise in light of the things we have just discussed. It begins by quoting St. Augustine who wrote in Confessions, our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. Now I invite you to please close your eyes wherever you are. With eyes closed, think about the person seated to your right and left. Think about others in this chamber who are of a different viewpoint than yours. Think about the constituents you represent back home. Think about the 10.8 million people you seek to serve together in this great state. Hear the desires of so many others at this very moment. And now also hear your own. Feel the restlessness, but then remember a different way. In dying to your own desires and living to fulfill those of others, we find God. We find rest. And though it is sacrificial and heart-wrenching, it is the heart of God and therefore the fulfillment of our own. Now rest in that as you live and govern as people who know the fulfillment of your heart's desire. Amen? Amen.
It's always a pleasure to uh, introduce and recognize our doctor of the day. And I'll call on the senator from the 56th to introduce our doctor of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, proud to uh, have Dr. Uh, Luke Lathrop here today. He is uh, an emergency physician at Wellstar Kennestone Hospital in Marietta. He's also the chief medical officer and co-founder of SmartMed in Roswell. He's got a great background in history. He got his undergraduate and his doctorate in St. Louis University. He is a native from Peoria, Illinois. He's a member of the American College of Emergency Physicians, the American Medical Association. And while not doing all the other important work he does, he enjoys uh, running triathlons or competing in triathlons, skiing and cycling, uh, and helping out in cardiovascular disease, EKG, and interpretations of different pr procedures and sedation. Please welcome uh, Dr. Lathrop to the Georgia State Center as our Doctor of the Day. Um, like Senator Albers said, I'm an ER doc, so uh, I'll be brief. I'm good at that. Um, I wanted to thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here, and thank you for all the hard work that you do every day. Thank you for helping to ensure that uh, all Georgians have access to quality health care. Uh, it's very important uh, as a doc. So, so thank you very much. Are there any unanimous consents? Does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Recognize senator from the tenth. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, members of this great body. I rise to talk about a good friend and also a trailblazer in these halls of the General Assembly. Uh, Sam Dumas, who I've known the entire time that I've served down here, was the very first African-American lobbyist to serve in this body. He started his career some 30 years ago when he served with Grady Hospital and then with Fulton County and DeKalb County and he even stepped out there on his own for well over a decade. But today I wanted to just stand before you and share his story because this is a story that needs to be told in this General Assembly. So Sam, I appreciate your service. I appreciate you working with me when I chaired the Black Caucus and helping us raise money for the events that we have and all the other things that he's done that mean so much to all of us that's been here in this body. I do know Lita Butler wanted to be here, unfortunately, and share her words with Sam, but she got called to a press conference, and I certainly hope and pray that some of my other colleagues that know Sam, that know the work that he's done, and he's sitting over here to my right, uh, will get up and just express their heartfelt appreciation 
for really a trailblazer, someone that has meant so much to so many. And as I walk these halls, I see so many other lobbyists of varying ethnicities. And I would have to say again that here's the man who started it all, Sam Dumas. Thank you, and I will present this to Sam. And I yield, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from 15. also to echo some of the comments made by the senator from the 10th. Sam Dumas uh, was basically around when I came and I chaired the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus. His services were invaluable. During that era, you didn't have much assist you didn't have any assistance to help you with the job that you were trying to do in serving the entire Georgia community. You didn't have any help other than people who are lobbyists or working in some of the departments in the state of Georgia government. Sam stepped up and served as the spearhead of a lot of those organizations. He served also Fulton County and DeKalb County. Just a sterling gentleman that worked to help everybody. Very essence of credibility about what he did in and around this capital, outstanding in this community. And I just want to let you know I stand with the Senator from the 10th in strong support of acknowledgement of his great service to the great state of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. If there's nobody else that's going to stand on behalf of the uh, the of this resolution. I'm going to let Sam have an opportunity to say a few words and, and thank everybody here who had uh, Lucas Come on up, Sam. Come on up. Y'all give Sam a big round of applause. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank the Senate for this recognition. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, the Legislative Black Caucus that I worked with when I came over to start lobbying. I started my career with Georgia Power Company on their lobbying team back in, in 1979, registered. And my first bill we worked on was Plant Vogel, the first unit of Plant Vogel, getting into the rate base. And that was a challenging time to me. And it has been a pleasure, though, working with elected officials over the years uh, in that behalf and the clients that I represent, the Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturer of America, Georgia Power, uh, Greater Health System, MARTA, and others. It has been a pleasure, and I have enjoyed it. And I look forward to enjoying my retirement, continue to enjoy my retirement. And I want to thank my homeboy, Roy Robinson, for, for, instant, for initiating this uh, recognition. Thank you, and thank you for everything that you do and your hard work you do for the state of Georgia. All right, good job, good job. Recognize Senator from the 16th. Well, good morning. On your desk t today, you'll find some ch gourmet chocolate chip cookies. These came from a uh, small business in our district. Does a phenomenal job with gourmet donuts and chocolate chip cookies. It's Finkel's Bakery. If you ever need chocolate chip or uh, you need donuts, he does a phenomenal job. So those are on your desk. The second thing on your desk is a book called A Case for Easter. As we enter into the Easter season, this is done by a legal journalist and talks about the case for Easter. If you think about this, Jesus Christ is the only person who ever came back from the dead and has millions of followers. And this does a legal situation where he goes back and looks at the case for what's there. So I'd encourage you there. That should be on your desk as well. And with that, I have time left, sir. And it's back to you. Recognize Senator from the 8th. Yeah. 
Mr. President, if the senators from the 24th, the 20th, the 51st, our majority leader, the 5th or the 22nd are here, come down here with me. I just want to uh, report, well actually, I think the senator from the 20th needs to be holding this because we had our legislative uh, livestock showdown at the Perry Fair this year and the senator, the senator from the 20th won best in show. And your Senate colleagues beat the House. And so beat we beat the House. All right. Come on. Beat them good. And I will tell you this, I know we, we, uh, we need to get going here, but uh, as the chairman of the House Ag Committee was watching, he and I were watching our, our team show, and he leaned over to me and he said, uh, he said, I think that y'all may be going to win. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, I think y'all drew better hogs. I just laughed and I said, no, sir, we've just, uh, we've just got better showers, so better talent. better talent. That's exactly right. So anyway, this is going to reside with us until next, next October. So, Mr. President, with that, right. we'll yield the well. That's what I'm talking about. Put it in the trophy, trophy uh, room there. We're adding up right now. We're adding up. So, Recognize Senator from the Seventh. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to welcome our friends from the Shia Ismaili community uh, who are here with us today to commemorate the beginning of spring with the festival of Navruz, as well as to mark the holy month of Ramadan. March 21st marks the celebration of Navruz, which marks the beginning of the Persian New Year in the spring equinox, the first day of spring. And it, and it is commemorated by diverse cultures and communities in Georgia around the world. Additionally, the Ismaili Muslim community contributes to Georgia's success through knowledge sharing, economic development, civic engagement, environmental stewardship, and our voluntary service. The Ismaili Civic is the global voluntary service organization for the Ismaili Muslim community, exemplifying Islam's core values of service, peace, compassion, and care for the vulnerable. And through Ismaili Civic's commitment to the environmental stewardship on Global Ismaili Civic Day, over 43,000 volunteers, of whom a majority were youth, engaged in over 900 activities in 31 countries to combat climate change. In Georgia, especially in Fulton, Gwinnett, Cobb, and Fayette counties, Ismaili Civic volunteers organized interfaith waterway and green space cleanups. If you would rise, please, in the gallery, we would like to now recognize the Ismaili Council and Ismaili Civic for their service across Georgia and wish everyone Ramadan and Navruz Mubarak. Thank you. I have this special resolution for you later. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield. Recognize Senator from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I come to you um, for, to celebrate a special day in my family. Today is World Down Syndrome Day. Um, we celebrate World Down Syndrome Day today on the third month, the 21st day, to signify the three copies of the 21st chromosome that uh, creates trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So I ask you to join me in celebrating um, because we are all more alike than different. Thanks, have a good day. I yield the will. Does any other senator wish to speak on point of personal privilege? You have before you a consent calendar of privilege resolutions. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution on the consent, consent calendar? Chair hears none. The resolution on the consent calendar is adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw and commit? You have before you a consent calendar of local bills. Ms. Secretary, we have any objections that have been filed for any of the bills? Mr. President, no objections have been filed. 
Is there objection to agreeing to the Board of Committee on the State and Local Governmental Operations, which is favorable to the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar? Chair hears none. The Board of the Committee is agreed to. Questions on the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar. All those in favor vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 38 and the nays are zero. This bill on the local consent calendar, having seen the Brexit Constitution majority is therefore passed. <laughs> Senator from the uh, 51st, Majority Leader, you ready? Recognize Senator from the 51st. Good morning, Mr. President. I move that House Bill 461 and House Bill 1090 be engrossed at this time. Senator move, has moved that House Bill 461 and House Bill 1090 be engrossed. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 1090, a bill by Representative Newton of the 127th and others, a bill to be entitled act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 7 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to the imposition, rate, computation, exemptions, and credits relative to income taxes, so as to expand the tax credit for contributions to foster child support organizations, to allow such organizations to include as qualified expenditures, wraparound, and mentorship services for justice-involved youth and further purposes.
House Bill 461, a bill by Representative Thomas of the 21st and others, a bill to be in town act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 13 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to general provisions regarding specific business and occupation taxes, so as to require that the proceeds of local government regulatory fees be used to pay for regulatory activity and not general operations and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator from Fitch first, recognize him to speak to the mo motion. Thank you, Mr. President. As usual, G Senators, we engross bills that come out of finance and ethics. So uh, I'm hoping by the time I get down out of this well that the rest of our members will be in their seats so we can take this engrossment vote. So please come to your seats. Thank you very much. Senators, do you have a, did you have something else you want to add? Senators from the 50, for what purpose do you rise? Oh, you want, oh, okay, some questions. Huh? So excited to get moving this morning. I just jumped out of the well, but I'm happy to take questions. Recognize Senator from the 50 for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the Senator yield? I sure will, from the man from Habersham. Um, a moment ago, we passed the um, Senate local consent calendar. I think we had 38 votes. How many ch senators are in the chamber? How many are in the chamber or should be in the should chamber? Should be in the chamber. Should be 56 okay. senators in the chamber. And this one, we're going to need everybody to vote on, won't we? That's right. We're going to need everybody to get to work. We've got a long day ahead of us, Senator. Well, no further questions. Thank you. S Senator from the 17th, do you have a question? As the majority leader yield. The man that kept me up all night. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll Glad you're it. thinking about me all night once again, Mr. Leader. Um, isn't it true I was worried I couldn't find a Senator from the 19th, but he is back this time? He has found his way back to the Senate. I think he was looking around in the House chamber for some money that may have been left in the budget. That's right. You further yield. I do. Isn't it probably now time for you to... Um, leave the well and let's take this vote. Have I stalled long enough? Yes, sir. I appreciate your concern, and uh, it is time to get to work. I'll give the well. Is there objection to the senator's motion? There is objection. Would you like to speak to the objection, Senator? Senator Waves. All right, all those in favor on the majority leader's motion to engross House Bill 461 and House Bill 1090, all those in favor of the motion will vote yea, all opposed nay, Secretary will not in the machine. On the motion, the yeas are 32, the nays are 16, and this motion has prevailed. So these House bills will be engrossed.
All right, all right. Uh, moving on to the rules calendar. House Bill 285. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 285, a bill by Representative Franklin of the 160th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 7 of Chapter 20 of Title 47 of the OCGA, the Public Retirement Systems Investment Authority Law, so as to raise the limit for the total percentage of funds that the Employees Retirement System of Georgia may invest in alternative investments and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Retirement recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Williams of the 25th District Chairman. Senator Harbin of the 16th and others offer the following amendment to amend House Bill 285 by replacing lines three and four with the following entities to provide for definitions, to provide for a timeline for compliance, to amend chapter six of title 47 of the OCGA relating to the Georgia legislative retirement system, so as to match the retirement benefit amounts payable for, to former legislators upon retirement and for the purposes. The Senate offers the following amendment to amend House Bill 285 by replacing lines four and five with the following. Alternative investments to provide for retirement system divestment from certain Chinese entities to provide for definitions, to provide for a timeline for compliance and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator from the 33rd, for what purpose do you rise? Senator from the 33rd, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 22nd for business inside the Capitol. Senator from the 20 what? 2-2. Two, two. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So, without objection, senator from the 22nd is excused. Recognize senator from the 16th to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yesterday we did uh, our bill for uh, HB 265 and it was our bill to increase the alternate investments, alternative investments from 5% to 10%. That was amended with an amendment that was longer which came where we took our adversaries and um, that said that we would not invest in China and other countries that are adversaries. There is also an amendment coming, uh, another friendly amendment coming through and what this is is to pick up legislative retirement and what it does is raises those who are already retired to brings them from $28 to $50. There is no physical uh, impact at all because the fund is already overfunded at 134%. And so it's simply to take care of those who have already retired and raise their limit is what the amendment is for. No questions. No questions. We have a couple of amendments here. Senator from the 46. Senator from the 46. Your amendments, Senator. Speak to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I thought you were just telling me how much you liked that amendment. Uh, I like it too. It makes sense. This one we talked about uh, the other day. It was about the divestment of investments by our retirement systems in our foreign adversaries, particularly China in this case. And uh, we passed this the other day. You got a different amendment? I think that's the author's amendment. Let me see that one. This is a senator from the 16th, but I can speak to it since I'm probably closer to retirement age than he is. Uh, this deals with legislative retirement. Since the first bill had retirement provisions in it, we currently are entitled to uh, legislative retirement if you opt in. And essentially it gives you $35 per month for each year served. So if you've served 10 years before you retire, you would receive 350 a month if you've opted in or paying into that program. So nobody really is going to be able to afford to retire on this, but it may help a little bit uh, along the way. The retirement 
fund is over uh, flowing right now. It is overfunded. This does not cost any taxpayer dollars. In other words, there's more money in there right now. All this does is increase it from $35 per month to $50 per month. So in my example, if you've served your 10 years and paid into the system, instead of receiving 350 a month, you'd get 500 a month uh, upon retirement. So we have had this uh, vetted. It looks like a, a good provision. It doesn't cost state any money and gives us a little more incentive to move on down the road, get out of here. I'd appreciate your uh, you, support for that. You do have one question, Senator. All right. Senator from the 34th. Senator Year? I do. Senator, are you telling me not to retire, just hang around a little while longer so I can get a little bit more money? If, yeah, that would be a good idea because we're going to miss you and we hope you will stay for a little bit longer. Thank you, but Senator. But I'll tell you this thing, you're not retiring for the money right now and this will make it a little bit better. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Thank I you, yield Senator. the will. You have no questions. Thank you, Senator. Does any other Senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair, here's none. The previous question is ordered. The question is on Amendment 1A. Amendment 1A authored by Senator from the 16th. Is there objection to Amendment 1A? That objection to Amendment 1A. 1A is added. Now the question is on Amendment 1 authored by the Senator from the 46th. Is there objection to this amendment? Hearing none, Amendment 1 is added. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill as amended. All those in favor of the bill will vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 45, the nays are 5. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed as amended. Secretary, Secretary Reed, House Bill 301. House Bill 301, a bill by Representative Ridley of the Six and others, a bill to be entitled act to amend Title 40 of the OCGA relating to motor vehicles and traffic, so as to revise the amount of civil monetary penalty for violations of improperly passing a school bus and speeding in a school zone and for their purposes. The Senate Committee on Public Safety recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Public Safety offers the following substitute to House Bill 301, a bill to be town and act to amend Chapter 80 of Title 36 of the OCGA relating to general provisions applicable to counties, municipal corporations, and other governmental entities, so as to provide for legislative findings, to provide for procedures for residents, and further purposes. Mm -hmm. 
Senator Hodges of the third offers the following amendment to amend Senate Committee on Public Safety Substitute to House Bill 301 by replacing line 15 with the following. In certain circumstances, to provide for timing when actions may be brought to challenge the abandonment of a public road and further purposes. A minority report has been filed. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the Senator from the 29th to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, I rise today with House Bill 301. I think what we've crafted here is a very good piece of legislation. Um, and as I went through this process, I met with several groups with concerns about it. And I had the opportunity to talk to them and to alleviate a lot of their concerns by explaining to them what we all know, that if there is Georgia law, already existing and any of us violate that Georgia law there's repercussions so when I, I was out in the hallway a few minutes ago talking to some individuals assuring them of some things agreeing on some things making sure they knew I haven't I hadn't changed anything and I came back in and there was a white piece of paper laying on top of my desk and it was the minority report and so I picked it up to read it and in the first paragraph, it said, HB 301 strips power away from local government and empowers the government, governor to remove local officials from elected posts. It gives private citizens the ability to initiate lawsuits against local government for violations of sanctuary policy. If such a lawsuit is initiated, most state and federal funding can be withheld Local officials responsible for such violations would be suspended without pay and the local governments must certify with the court that they are now in compliance with state law. Further, the local government sovereign immunity would be waived for any cause of action during the pendency of this proceeding. Friends, that's all absolutely correct. If a local municipality chooses to blatantly violate Georgia law, that's what happens. We're elected officials. We all raise our right hands and we take oaths. We take oaths to the US Constitution. We take oaths to the Georgia Constitution. And guess what? You may be a United, I mean, uh, you may be a Georgia state senator, but you are not above Georgia law. You may be a mayor, you may be a city councilor, you may be a county commissioner but you are not above Georgia law. And what this bill does is if you go out there and you want to be a sanctuary city that violates Georgia law, then you're going to be held accountable for that. And we're going to take funding away from you, state funding and federal funding that we're responsible for, but none of that funding is going to be that emergency funding that you need. It's going to be the things that you want to go out there and get to, for the for what I call the the accessories that a lot of our communities have. I was able to come to this body a few years back and get one million dollars for a library in Troop County. The Callaway Foundation gave another million, and Troop County gave a million. So for a three million dollar investment, I was able to get 33 percent of it from the state and take it back to Troop County. Now, if Troop County at that time had been in violation, if they had declared themselves a place of sanctuary for individuals violating Georgia law, then I couldn't have gotten that $1 million for that library if this law had been in place. So while we all enjoyed Chicken Little as kids, as we all ran around and heard about this small, small bird that said the sky was falling. The sky is not falling under 301. It's really, really simple. Follow law that I doubt very few of us in this room, and I know there are a few of, uh, that have been in here for a while. My, my friend from the 15th and, and my friend from the 46th back there, they were around when the sanctuary legislation was passed. But it was passed, and it's law and people have to follow the law. And 301 
reminds them of that. And it tells them if you don't follow the law, a citizen can come out and file an action against you for not following the law. And then if you decide to cure it and you decide to follow the law, then you can get some of that, you get that money back. It's that simple. 301 is that simple, follow the law. The minority report is right. Sadly, in the second paragraph, the minority report runs off a, a, down a pig trail about politics in Washington, D.C. None of us serve in Washington, D.C. We may read the newspapers, we may listen to the different television shows, and we may come up with our own opinions of what the problem is in Washington, D.C., but I'll tell you right now, our problem with immigration on a federal level rests clearly in the hands of Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. for several administrations that have failed to do the job. And we're suffering from their failure. But in the state of Georgia, we're responsible to hold all of our elected officials accountable for following the law. That's what 301 does. It's that simple. So simple. Mr. President, I yield the well. Senator has yielded. Recognize Senator from the 14th. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator from the 29th and I agree about something very important about this bill and that it's very simple. That Georgia already has a sanctuary policy that says that local governments cannot adopt sanctuary style policies that are enumerated in the statute that you already see before you. In fact, it's so simple and so straightforward what local governments are already not allowed to do that any person in Georgia can bring what's called a mandamus action. That is a fancy Latin word that means that a citizen can ask the government of Georgia to enforce its own laws. In fact, compel the government of Georgia to enforce its own laws. Any person can bring it. It's called a petition for mandamus. So I can tell you, in the status quo right now, if a local government adopted any sort of sanctuary policy or practice even, a person can go to a superior court and say, no, the government has to enforce its own laws. So the rest of this bill is just what I would call a lawsuit bill. This is a private right of action bill. Probably the largest expansion of private rights of action that this Senate will consider the entirety of this session or term. And there are two halves to this bill, both of them problematic. The first half in section one, says that you can sue a local government because they're not following the law. As I told you, you can already do that. Section two, well, and of course, there's a state funding uh, piece of it. You can lose all your state funding for as long as you're found to be in violation. Section two says that any resident of the state can file a petition in front of the Board of Community Affairs to unseat local elected officials who've been duly elected by their communities. So let's go back to the beginning of what the author said. This is quite simple. We already have a law in the books, so and we already have a way to enforce it. All this bill does is threaten complete financial extinction of the local government, state and federal funding, and threaten removal of every elected official who serves the local government if they don't follow existing law. And in so doing, what this bill does is elevate a sanctuary policy or practice as a policy issue to the same level that this state treats felony convictions. Essentially, if you have a sanctuary practice of any kind, and let me be clear about what that might include, let me paint a picture for you. If one sheriff's deputy, one line police officer decides that they want to ignore ICE's calls, it doesn't matter if the local government has a stated policy you now give somebody the ability to sue. When I drop my wacky uh, consumer protection bills that I hear from our friends at the convenience stores and grocery stores about, like the stuff, I, I dropped a bill this year that says, if the price on the shelf says one thing, you can't go to the register and have it ring, rung up as something else. And you have a consumer sort of right of action. And the complaint is, look, we don't think that's necessarily bad policy, but the problem is that bill would allow more people to sue. Even if we end up winning, we still have to go to court because somebody might allege something that happened. And that's exactly what this bill does. One case where a deputy doesn't you know, cooperate with ICE, and all of a sudden you have a lawsuit, 
either the first half of the bill to strip all the funding or the second half of the bill to unseat every local elected official just because one or two people is upset about a specific case or a specific decision. Y'all, that's wacky. That's really wacky law. So to elevate this one issue above every other issue, I think we can be honest about what's happening. We are reacting, this is a reactive bill, to a horrible tragedy in Athens that every single person in this room has stood up to recognize as a horrible tragedy for, for multiple reasons. We're making bad law in response to that tragedy. And let me highlight one last thing for you about this bill that I think really drives the point home if you are an unauthorized or undocumented immigrant in this state, this bill gives you new rights to sue the government. And that is because the phrase, any resident of this state, found on lines 116, 63, 67, includes unauthorized and undocumented immigrants. Why? because the word resident is defined in the Georgia Code to include them. Guess why? For one reason, so they can pay taxes. But there's recognition in Georgia law already that unauthorized immigrants are part of the community. And this bill, unthinkingly, grants them the same rights to sue as everybody else. So that's a microcosm of the type of irony or hypocrisy that goes into our legislating on immigrants, which is this. While they work for us, while they pay taxes for us, while they send their kids to schools and raise families here, and they're here, millions of people are here doing that and being productive members of a thriving community, we grant them these rights already. With this bill, we'll grant them new rights too, because they're residents. But in the same breath, we will act like they are wholly other or separate people who are on the other side of a wall, who don't deserve to be here, who need to be forcibly deported. In the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, we heard testimony from a senator, local chamber of commerce along the Texas border doesn't want to shut off immigration completely because they are, immigrants are such a, an integrative part of our society. So this bill will pass today, but I just wanted to highlight for you that as we elevate this one policy issue to be nuclear on the same level as corruption, fraud, felonies by elected officials, to make this issue the one true issue above all others in terms of the severity of our policy response, we do so while turning a blind eye to the fact that even this bill itself does not meaningfully distinguish between the people who live in our community. Mr. President, I'll yield for any questions. You do have a few questions, Senator. Recognize Senator from the 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the Senator yield? I do. The uh, American Immigration Council believes there's more than a million illegal immigrants in our state. At what point would you declare an illegal invasion? You know, the word invasion is a pretty loaded word, and it's kind of at the forefront of the Senator's political talking points and many political actors nationwide. I think the question we have to ask ourselves before we sing Les Mis songs and gather weapons or whatever it is people are itching to do is ask who's going to pick our crops? Who's going to do home care and, and take care of our elderly? Who are going to do these jobs that we're so sure that Americans want to or can compete for in the same way that currently many immigrants are doing now? And that's just one end of an economic spectrum. Let's ask the question, how are we going to replace the highly talented, skilled people who come here on H-1 visas and do essential, electronic, state-of-the-art work for us to keep us competitive at American-based businesses? And are we so sure that we can contain our rhetoric? When we pass bills like this in response to a tragedy that are not proportional to what happened and probably wouldn't have prevented the tragedy, do we think about the fact that we are poisoning the well for the narrative about immigrants in this country, that we're making it increasingly politically difficult to protect the contributions that immigrants already make to our society? Are we asking those questions? And so in response to the question about the invasion, I would say if we skip straight to that rhetoric, then we're ignoring a lot of those questions, Senator. Does the Senator further yield? I do. 
Isn't it that Democrats always say that they help the poor? Doesn't it by bringing in these types of visas only hinder the poor in our society by lowering wages? Um, can, can you reframe the question? Yeah, so if the poorest amongst our society or who Democrats like yourself like to praise that they prop up and help, doesn't allowing these types of illegals to come in and work for subpar wages, doesn't that like hinder the poorest amongst our society? So there's a lot of assumptions packed in that question. What I'll say is my last experience with microeconomics was in grad school. And I did have a working awareness at that time of supply and demand curves. Uh, my best guess in the year of our Lord 2024 as to what would happen uh, if you took away some of the immigrants who are doing jobs that a lot of Americans don't want to do is that prices would go up because there would be less supply. And then consumers who go to the grocery store would be complaining about higher prices because there weren't people to do those jobs. Recognize the senator from the 36 for a question. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. Does uh, Senator yield? To my esteemed Congressman, I sure do. Uh, uh, Senator, could you talk a, a bit more about the impact on our schools uh, were this bill to become the policy of Georgia? Uh, the um, uh, um, making requirements of uh, that a school discloses uh, a, a student's status to ICE, for I, example? I think the Senator is absolutely right to suggest that there's already ambiguity in the law about what government officials, even in schools, do or don't have to do when it comes to disclosure, protecting identities of people, students in the school. What this bill does is take a slap on the wrist, or in some cases, other real sanctions that already exist mm -hmm. that would help to at least guide behavior in a proportional way, and it would make those penalties nuclear where if a school district had, again, I said in my speech, one small case where a teacher exercises discretion and maybe a disgruntled parent knows the identity of a student because their friends mm -hmm. you know, told who, who they were, and that parent then files one of these lawsuits because they don't want the kid in the school, now all of a sudden you've got school board funding on the line completely. You've got the question of whether the state government is going to step in and unseat all the elected officials in that jurisdiction, and you just create massive legal uncertainty. I didn't even get to talk in my speech about the sovereign immunity waiver, which by the way says that for as long as uh, uh, any jurisdiction's out of compliance, we now don't even consider the city a sovereign anymore. I mean, that's what we mean when we say we make this policy a nuclear level issue, is that the normal protections afforded a subdivision of this state get completely taken away because we've decided that this is somehow the one issue that governs every other issue in the state. So that's the level of magnitude that we're, we're not, this is not an exaggeration, that's the level of magnitude you were talking about that one parent could initiate in a school setting if they didn't like uh, that somebody's identity wasn't being waved all over the place. Uh, thank you for that fulsome response, which I think is, is, is spot on. Um, and just to, just to draw that out a bit further, anybody in the state under this bill would have jurisdiction to file actions against local governments and file complaints before the Board of Community Affairs, isn't that true? And this would allow a single activist to file suit against every single local government in the state and overwhelm the Board of Community Affairs. That's precisely correct, and I, I don't want to bring up the voting context per se, because I know that can be a sensitive partisan issue for both sides, but like with voter challenges, for example, it's this idea that if you were a local activist in a different part of the state, you could drive to a jurisdiction that you wanted to harass and file this lawsuit, file this petition against anybody in another community or another jurisdiction just because you're a resident somewhere in the state. So, you know, this mandamus stuff that I was talking about earlier where we can already sue, pretty potent stuff because it already gives the ability for any citizen to sue. The only key is that the, the requirement in the law be non-discretionary so that we trust a citizen to enforce clear mandates of the law. What this bill does, of course, is it harps on existing ambiguities to make the consequence of not nailing the decision uh, nuclear and it's so ambiguous and it's so wide open who can sue that it creates that sort of existential risk probably you know again based on whoever whichever activist is willing to start the fight uh, if you'll further yield sure um, we are surely as people who are looking at this issue of immigration we are surely keenly aware of the fact that a bipartisan group 
of federal lawmakers came together to craft uh, some immigration policy breakthroughs. Is that not the case? It, it is. And, 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 and further, would it not be a better use of our collective efforts to be asking our federal members of Congress to support that bill? Senator, I'll say this, because half the room or more will disagree with us about whether to support that bill, but I think even bringing up the federal effort is such a good point because that shows the type of negotiations that need to happen to actually solve this problem. Whichever side you're on, that's the conversation you need to have as opposed to a bill that breaks local government that says, yeah. we'll unseat all your elected officials, we'll take away all your state funding, we will make you vulnerable to a whole bunch more lawsuits. Again, a lawsuit bill uh, if you don't behave perfectly on this issue in the eyes of every activist in the state. Well, and finally, given that, as you just said, it opens, it opens it's, it's game on for, for the charging local governments and local schools uh, with offenses. What does that do to the insurance premiums since they can't use um, public funds to defend against these types of suits? Uh, the likelihood is that legal insurance premiums are going to rise as insurance companies adjust for this new financial risk that this sweeping bill has opened up. Senator, I agree with the implication that maybe what the Senate could use is a study committee uh, that could assess the impact that regressive immigration reform has on school boards insurance rates. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Senator. With that, I'll yield the well. Senator is yielded. Break it down to the Senator from the 42nd to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, I believe that I heard um, my good friend, the minority, uh, majority whip, mention that really it's Democrats' fault that, that this uh, situation has not been resolved in, in Washington for 30 years. And so I, do, I have a couple points I wanted to make on that. First of all, the mere statement of it demonstrates that, as it, sort of echoing the senator for the four, from the 14th, demonstrates that really we are pretty far out of our lane in um, debating this, and of course probably poised to call, cause all sorts of unintended consequences in bringing up what is a, a federal issue. And as a matter of fact, as you probably all know, the Court of Appeals uh, in the Fifth Circuit has ruled several times in the last couple days that uh, Texas is overstepping its jurisdiction in, in attempting to pass state laws surrounding immigration. So that's, that's the baseline here. Uh, all the finger pointing about Democrats in Washington have done X, Republicans in Washington have done X. That's right, it's about what our colleagues that we send to Washington and what they are doing to discuss um, an issue that is a serious issue. There has been a broken in immigration system for, for a number of decades now, and it is on them to solve it and fix the problem. It's actually not on us, and I would, would suggest that we should be very careful and treading extremely cautiously in what um, likely will have all, all sorts of unanticipated consequences. But in order to make sure that some narrative that Democrats have wanted open borders and Republicans have been for law, order, and closed borders for the past 30 years and right there willing to solve the immigration crisis while Democrats have obstructed it nonstop does not take root, I do want to point out just a couple of things. I know that uh, Republicans would prefer a narrative that they are the party for immigration management and border security, but the facts over these decades show that to be patently false. Republicans in Washington, before, during, and since Trump, have killed comprehensive immigration reform time and again. In May 2006, when Republicans controlled both the US House and Senate, an article from then, writing in The Hill, a reporter, Stuart Verdery, gave us the rundown. House Republicans passed an enforcement-only bill, the Sensenbrenner Bill, House. The Senate passed the Bipartisan Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act, but the bills were never reconciled. 
Then, in 2007, when Democrats controlled the Senate, the Senate debated the Kennedy-Kyle Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act of 2007 for a month on the floor of the Senate, but failed to overcome a Republican filibuster. Then Senator Biden was a yes vote for that comprehensive immigration reform. In 2013, the Senate in Washington, again taking the lead through the bipartisan Gang of Eight, negotiated the Border Security, Economic Opportunity, and Immigration Modernization Act. This was a massive and comprehensive bill. It got 67 votes in the Senate, but the Republican-controlled House refused to take it up. In 2018, the government shut down after negotiations between President Trump and Senate Democrats to pair Dreamer legislation, everyone knows what I'm talking about there, children brought to this country when they were extremely young, illegally, um, but through no fault of their own, Dreamer legislation with enforcement provisions. So each side gives a little, a compromise, a deal to be struck. That then failed and the government shut down. So the list of opportunities to secure the border that were actually thrown in the trash bin by congressional Republicans is quite long. But none of these compares to the lost opportunity of the most recent debacle when President Biden requested funding for American allies facing the gravest wars and threats abroad, threats to their very existence, along with border security measures. The border security bipartisan um, border security bill negotiated in Washington in the U.S. Senate included asylum reform, wall funding, emergency border authorities, $48 million for fighting fentanyl trafficking, and asylee work eligibility. Many of these, these things in that bipartisan negotiated bill were long sought priorities of Republicans and would have gone a long way toward getting our immigration court system and broken asylee uh, protection system up and running and changed the status quo dramatically on the crisis that we currently have. Changed it dramatically. And Republicans tanked it at the request of President Trump. So he could try to preserve what he views as a good issue for him on the campaign trail. And that's a real shame because you don't do harm to the government, to the people of the United States. You don't, ref you don't say no on long sought priorities of your party to try to maintain a campaign issue because why on earth do you have power then? It's just power for power's sake. It's not to do anything for the United States of America. So I reject a false narrative that Democrats want open borders and Republicans are the ones standing up to uh, control the border. That is patently false. Let's tell our folks in Washington to fix this problem. Let's tell them to pass the bill with all of the excellent provisions, many of which were huge priorities of Republicans for years. Tell them to go ahead and pass it and let's stop messing around at the state level on an issue that we have no business meddling in that is surely gonna cause untold problems for our local governments. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Senator is yielded. Senator from the third, would you like to speak to your amendment? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> this uh, amendment is a friendly amendment. It does absolutely nothing to change the character of the bill that is brought to you by my friend from the 29th. What it does do is it addresses a problem that has come up in my district, a problem that's come up in my district and could come up in any of your districts or any of your counties. The problem basically is it, in one of my counties, uh, about 20 years ago, um, 
the duly elected county commission decided to abandon some roads um, at the time uh, remember the decision um, it was a popular decision and um, and so 20 years later someone <clears throat> in our community has decided to file suit to try to set aside excuse me <clears throat> set aside the abandonment what this bill does is it requires that if you're going to challenge an abandonment that you do so within two years of the official uh, date of that abandonment it does nothing about uh, changing your right to challenge any abandonment in your local community it just requires that you do it in a timely manner and again you know i'd never heard of this before but here it is happening in my community it could happen in yours and this amendment would would keep that from happening i think um, we got a lot of bills today so i'm not going to go into the ramifications of this but uh, mr president i'll just yield the well if unless there are any questions you have no questions senator thank you senator from the 56 what purpose do you rise mr president i move the previous question hold that thought senator because you we've got uh, i think we're at the final speaker right now for the minority report so Senator from the six, I believe you're, you're up, and I believe you're delivering the minority report. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in opposition to HB 301, and I'm trying to... Uh, get the right words because it's frustrating when we have bad bills placed in front of us that deserve worthy debate yet for the second day in a row we have attempts to cut off that debate on bills again that we shouldn't be dealing with in the first place we should be actually addressing issues that are impacting everyday Georgians. But here we are, trying to make political points, trying to put our local officials, our sheriffs, our counties, our schools, in positions where they have to waste taxpayer dollars. And that's all this bill is. It is a waste of taxpayer dollars that does not solve our immigration crisis. I'm gonna give you an example of how this bill is bad and has negative consequences and would not do a thing to solve the intended purpose. The senator from the 14th mentioned that a lot of this bill it was about lawsuits and giving a private right of action for any stakeholder who's a resident of the state to bring a lawsuit against a local governing body. Those governing bodies, according to line 41, include school districts. And the bill prohibits school districts from, any, from enforcing any sanctuary policy, which on line 47 is defined as any regulation, rule, policy, or practice that's adopted by a local governing body. Now, had we done a little bit more research on this issue, we would know that school districts are federally required to serve students regardless of documentation status. School districts are federally required to serve every student 
regardless of documentation status. And as a result, would not be communicating or cooperating with federal officials in reporting the status of a student who may be an immigrant. In fact, beyond federal law, beyond court cases, there are rules and regulations that prohibit school districts from doing what this bill requires them to do. So we're putting our school districts in a position where they either comply with this state law or they comply with federal law and violate this state law. Ultimately, I'm hopeful that the Supremacy Clause would prevail in this instance and the school system would be able to dismiss any lawsuit. But unfortunately, those school districts are not exempt from the legal fees that would come from those frivolous lawsuits, from the increased spending on lawyers that many of you like to deride and make fun of each and every day. It would not save school districts from increased insurance costs. And ultimately, who has to bear that price? Taxpayers. And colleagues, I'm not talking about taxpayers in Atlanta. I'm not talking about taxpayers in Columbus. I'm talking about taxpayers in every single one of your districts. Because there will be groups that will be bringing lawsuits in every single one of your districts. And here's the frustrating part about this whole discussion, is that I came here to this body to solve problems. And what I've seen is too often we waste on our time on politicking that obviously and will never actually solve problems. If we really wanted to solve the immigration crisis, we would be stopping the exploitation of those who are undocumented in this state. And every single one of us is complicit on one hand, calling this immigration crisis a, an invasion. As if these people are coming here unwanted. When the reality is, many of the industries that every single one of you advocate on beha behalf of have exploited this community. Our agriculture industry, poultry, Construction, manufacturing, care workers, every single industry that is touted in this building has exploited this very community. Yet here we are, exploiting them for political purposes. Shame on every single one of us. Because there is no one in this chamber that is not no, someone who has hired, or has hired someone who is not undocumented. Yet here we are, using them as political chess pieces. Shame on us. Mr. President, I yield the well. All right, there's uh, no one else signed up to speak. Um, so I think we can close debate here. Senator. Colleagues, I want to thank everybody that came up and spoke. I heard the word frustrating and I heard the word false narrative. And let's be clear on what false narrative is. One individual came up here and said, lose all state funding. 
explicitly said that wouldn't happen when I got up here. The bill explicitly says that. False narrative. Another person got up here and said, I got up here and blamed the Democrats. My words were the Democrats and the Republicans in Washington, D.C. have caused this problem. False narrative. Another person got up here and said that my bill would impact school districts. Read the portion that talks about school districts and pray tell if there's not, that, that's not underlined, that's already Georgia law. False narrative. And if there's going to be any entity in this state that is comprised of elected officials that choose to violate Georgia law and you accept it, then shame on you. Because I'll tell you something. I have people in my family that came over from Mexico and came over from other countries and don't look like me. And they came over here the right way. They went through the process and got everything done the right way. And they live over here legally. They live over here as good lawful residents of the state of Georgia. And because I look like I look, that I should be ashamed of doing what's right and following Georgia law? Well, if that's what you feel, honestly, deep in your heart, then shame on you. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Senators, close debate. We're going to take up the uh, First Amendment here. Question on adoption, adoption of Amendment Number 1 authored by the senator from the third. Is there objection to am amendment number one? Without objection, amendment number one is added. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute as amended. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute as amended? Hearing none, the committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 33, the nays are 18. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. Secretary Reed, House Bill 1072. House Secretary, Bill. Re Secretary Reed, 1058. I'm sorry. 1058. House Bill 1058, a bill by Representative McDonald of the 26 and others, a bill to be town and act to amend code section 418 of the OCGA relating to safe operations of motor vehicles, commercial motor vehicles, and drivers, and safe transportation of hazardous materials, so as to update the reference date to federal regulations regarding the safe operation of motor carriers and commercial motor vehicles and further purposes. The Senate Committee on Transportation recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Dolezal of the 27th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President.
Recognize the senator from the 29th. Speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, this should be very non-controversial. What we're doing, as you see on line 15, this is the normal update. We're changing the date from January 1st, 2023 to January 1st, 2024 to amend code section 1, uh, excuse me, 40-1-8 related to commercial motor vehicles. Thank you, Mr. President. If I have no questions, I'll yield the well. No, you have no questions, Senator. Thank you. Does any other Senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 48 and the nays are zero. This bill has received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. Secretary Reed, House Bill 1072. House Bill 1072, a bill by Representative Cooper of the 45th and others, a bill to the Town Act to amend Article 10 of Chapter 8 of Title 31 of the OCGA relating to the Drug Repository Program. So as to revise definitions to provide for pharmacist to pharmacy technician ratios in the program and for their purposes. The Senate Committee on Health and Human Services recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Watson of the first district chairman. The Health and Human Services Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 1072. A bill to be a act to amend Titles 26, 31, and 48 of the OCGA relating to food, drugs, and cosmetics, health, and revenue, and taxation, respectively, so as to increase the public's access to prescription drugs by increasing the number of pharmacy technicians authorized to be supervised by a pharmacist in certain circumstances and for the purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 28th. Speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise to present HB 1072. This bill authorizes the Georgia State Board of Pharmacy to increase the maximum ratio of pharmacists to pharmacy technicians for closed door pharmacies and clarifies that two technicians must be certified when a pharmacist directly supervises more than the maximum ratio of technicians. Additionally, this legislation amends the pharmacist to pharmacy technician ratios for DPH's drug repository rep program and allows for substitution of drugs in some instances. It also requires reverse drug distributors to make and document diligent efforts to donate drugs rather than to destroy them. And it also provides certain exemptions from sale and use taxes. I want to thank the majority whip for his good work on this legislation with me. And I uh, will yield for questions. Senator. Thank you. I urge your favorable consideration for HB 1072. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? 
Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor, vote yay. All opposed, nay. Secretary, unlock the machines. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 50 and the nays are 1. This bill having received requisite constitution majority is therefore passed by substitute. Moving on to House Bill 1090. Secretary. House Bill 1090. A bill by Representative Newton of the 127th and others, a bill to be entitled act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 7 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to the imposition, rate, computation, exemptions, and credits relative to income taxes, so as to expand the tax credit for contributions to foster care, child support organizations, and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Finance recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Huff Settler of the 52nd District Chairman. The Senate Finance Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 1090, a bill to be taught an act to amend Chapter 7 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to income taxes, so as to expand the tax credit for contributions to foster child support organizations and for the purposes. Additionally, a fiscal note has been attached. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 28th. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise to present to you HB 1090, simply expands the tax credit for contributions to foster child support organizations, allowing these organizations to include as qualified expenditures, wraparound, and mentorship services for justice-involved youth, as well as it expands the wraparound services that are qualified expenditures. With that, I'll yield for questions. Sorry. No Thank you. you should have a physical note in your um, pamphlet. Thank you. All right. Did you get that physical note? Is that what you said, Senator? Probably a good reason why you don't have one. Mm -hmm. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none and the previous question is ordered. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the reporter committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the reporter committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of the bill vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. <laughs> Senator from the 20th, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Does this bill have anything to do with Representative Demetrius Douglas's recess bill since, since it has a physical note? 
you know, that's something you probably should address with the senator while he was in the whale, <laughs> Senator. Recognize the senator from 28. For what purpose do you rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Mr. President, is it not true that the senator from the 21st helped me greatly on this bill, and I appreciate his help? Always good to give accolades where they're due, Senator. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 50 and the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. House Bill 1105. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 1105. A bill by Representative Petrie of the 166 and others, a bill to be titled an act to amend Title 42 of the OCGA relating to penal institutions, so as to require the Commissioner of Corrections to report certain information regarding the immigration status, offenses, and home counties of persons who are confined under the authority of the Department of Corrections and for the purposes. The Senate Committee on Public Safety recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. The Senate Public Safety Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 1105, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 17 of the OCGA relating to criminal procedure so as to authorize immigration status verification prior to issuance of citation in lieu of arrest for certain offenses, to provide for and revise definitions, to provide for acceptable documentation for purposes of attempting to verify immigration status and for other purposes. Senator Albers of the 56 and others offer the following Amendment 1 to amend the Senate Committee on Public Safety substitute to House Bill 1105 by replacing lines 27 through 29 with the following. Certain convicted persons in custody subject to an immigration detainer notice to provide for related matters, to provide for a short title, to provide for legislative intent and further purposes. Additionally, a minority report has been filed. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the chairman from the 56. Speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. I bring before you a very important bill, House Bill 1105, which is the Georgia Criminal Alien Track and Report Act of 2024. This bill has been a product of many years worth of work. Although many of you may think this was punctuated by the very tragic and avoidable loss of Lake and Riley, my constituent, as well as her family. But this work actually precedes that happening. And it is important that we are doing everything possible to follow the law at all levels to protect Georgians. This is a public safety issue, make no mistake. And it specifically deals with criminals and I want to say that a few times, criminals, so we don't have folks come up afterwards and say this is about immigration, this is about something else. It's about criminals that are found to be illegal aliens. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank the bill's author from the House and the people that have worked together over the last week and a half, spending countless hours in order to bring this bill to, we believe, a perfected mode. From the governor's office, our own lieutenant governor and president of his body, members of the House, especially the members of the Senate Public Safety Committee, key stakeholders and legislative council. I want to give an extraordinary amount of thanks and gratitude to the Georgia Sheriff's Association, who have been our partners throughout this process. And on your desk, one of the many pieces of paper you'll see is an endorsement from the sheriffs for this bill. There is also one amendment that I will talk about at the end, which was some cleanup language in both the sheriffs as well as the governor's office. I'm going to quickly move through the sections of this bill. This talks about how immigration terminology is used by making sure we're consistently using 
the nomenclature in federal and then state law. And specifically, we implore our State Board of Pardons and Paroles, we implore them to not release someone early unless they have guaranteed that person is going to be picked up by ICE and deported. Now, you might question that. Has that happened? Well, based on the numbers we're getting, about 90% of the people that are put on an ICE detainer, and I want to make sure you understand what that means, we can hold someone for two days on an ICE detainer. And if there are no other criminal charges at that point, they must be let go if not picked up by ICE. And almost 90% of them are not being picked up. Now, some people came to the well for House Bill 301 and said this is a congressional issue. Well, you know what? Three and a half years ago, 90% of them were picked up. And we have four to five times the crossings in the border of folks in our country illegally. Continuing on to Section 3, this is a procedure for us to capture who is arrested and to make sure we are seeking at all possible ways the ability to authorize their immigration status. In Section 4, we are stating the Immigration and Nationality Act of how people violate that, again, to make sure we are concurrent with Georgia law and the specific items we use to identify people which are listed from driver's license and other identification cards, et cetera, to make sure that everybody is clear on what is simply right and wrong. In Section 5, we have a very clear legislative intent, and that is this Georgia General Assembly is promoting compliance with state law relating to the deterring the presence of criminal illegal aliens and requiring Georgia law enforcement officers or officials to work with federal immigration authorities and utilize all the resources available to them. Now, we cannot change federal law, but we can do everything possible with the tools in state law to protect our citizens. State and local agencies shall promote compliance with the state law related to deterring the presence of a criminal illegal aliens and they are to be authorized to enter into memorandums of agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, and any other federal agency regulated to enforcing federal immigration laws. Now, you've heard some of them over the years. One of them is called 287G. There are only a handful in Georgia that have that. That program is actually no longer live anymore, but those that are in it are grandfathered. Then they came out with another program called Safe Communities, and about two dozen of our law enforcement agencies have safe communities. If they have those type of solutions and connections today and we bring someone in, when they're fingerprinted, it will actually go to the ICE database and say whether well, they're in our country illegally. But for everybody else that doesn't exist today, we have been working with a group of people, talking to Department of Homeland Security, helping out with some of our federal counterparts to get that access again. And our local folks, absolutely want that. But unfortunately, the politics in Washington, D.C. said, no, we don't want to give you access to see if somebody is here illegally. Why? Why? There is no good reason why we should not be checking someone's status if we cannot prove they're in this country legally. Continuing down, I'm not going to read this entire bill to you, but I want to hit the strong points. In Section 6, this talks about how we identify immigration status, local and governing bodies, and sanctuary policy. This is a big change from what the House passed over to us in work we did with the Georgia Sheriff's Association and other law enforcement officials. It says that it shall be unlawful for any local official or employee to knowingly and willingly violate any provision in this code section. That means people who make a mistake, which certainly will never criminalize that. However, another handout on your desk, you will see from the sheriff of the second largest county in this state, who is absolutely knowingly and willingly disobeying the law. Moving into Section 7, this talks about relating to customs and how we're going to publish reports. 
And you're going to see this in two areas, both from the Department of Corrections, which is your state prison system, as well as from other law enforcement agencies. Most of that is sheriffs. So we do have some local uh, city and counties that have jails outside of the sheriff's office. And in each one of these areas, they're going to have a list on their website. And it's going to be effective no later than December 31st of this year, where you're going to be able to look up in your county or where else how many people are in that jail or in that prison that are in this country illegally. And then, maybe even more importantly, how many of them were not picked up after that two-day ICE detainer? And I hope the transparency and the public outcry will force the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. to allow the connection of those systems to happen again. I think everybody in this chamber would support transparency. I know somebody may come up and say, well, we're afraid there'll be a perception well, this is not about perception. The law is pretty straightforward. This is showing people who are criminals and here in our country illegally. And on your desk is yet a third handout that shows you the 1,579 people currently in the Georgia prison system that are in this country illegally on an ICE detainer. When they finish their sentence, whenever that day is, they have two days to be picked up by ICE. And history tells us right now, almost all of them will not be. Continuing through this bill, it talks about the different forms of identification again and talks about different people who have different status, such as somebody here legally. We never want to cause any harm with that. This is not about anyone who comes to our country legally nor anybody who has got a green card that's here as a consular corps or anything else or has a valid passport. Skipping down toward the end of this bill, and there's going to be an amendment I'll talk about in a moment, it talks about when someone has been convicted of a felony in Section 13 that we will then also capture their DNA. I want to thank our newest senator, um, from the 8th who brought that forward as a former law enforcement agency. When that was brought forward to us, it also included misdemeanors. That is being taken out in the amendment that is before you today. That is the bill in its substantive total. I do want to address a couple of items that I read in the minority report. It begins on the fourth paragraph that says, our sheriffs think the legislature would be overstepping by criminalizing noncompliance. Well, the Georgia sheriffs endorsed the bill. Next, it says, Department of Homeland Security has a budget of $122.75 billion, and they do not need our local law enforcement to do their jobs. Really? because 90% of the people are not being picked up. So clearly, clearly they need help. Although I believe the men and women who are serving on the streets as law enforcement are the good folks, but it is certainly the administration bureaucrats in Washington who have cut off access to those systems and have given a directive not to pick those people up. There is amendment number one before you. It is the only amendment that I will support if there are more. This does several things. Most of them are just small technical cleanups. On line se seven of the amendment, this is mirroring federal code that a person of 18 years of age or older. Cleanup on lines 57 and 58. Again, most of this stuff is, is simple updates. It does, on the back, remove the misdemeanor on line 30 of the amendment, which replaces line 433 with only a felony. Again, these technical cleanups were done with the sheriffs, with the governor's office, et cetera. And there's also an auditing provision put in here, which was a great addition, which up to 5% every year of our local governing authorities, as well as Department of Corrections, are going to be audited through the Department of Audits here at the state to make sure people are conforming to this important law. I know everybody who walked in here today had already decided how they're going to vote on this bill. We can make it about a lot of things that it's not, but this is very simple and I'll repeat it as I close. 
This is about criminals who are in our country illegally. We are a pro-public safety state. We back the blue. We care more about the victims than we do the criminals. This is good legislation that will ultimately save people's lives. And with that, Mr. President, I'll yield for a couple of questions. You do have a question, Senator. Recognize Senator from 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? Certainly. I uh, really appreciate the piece of legislation, Senator. Um, I do have uh, a little bit of concern with Section 3, if you don't mind turning there with me. When, when it's related to misdemeanors of trespass, retail theft, um, manufacturing drugs, it, you've, you've said shall quite a bit, but at the bottom it says, and be authorized to seek and verify the immigration status of the accused so why not put a shall in there? That's a good question, Senator, and I appreciate you bringing it forward. The challenge is we do not have access for most of our law enforcement to do that. As I mentioned earlier, uh, 287G is a legacy program and only a handful of departments have that. And then about two dozen or so have what's called safe communities. They're the only people that have direct access in order to check someone through a fingerprint of whether they're here illegally. Unfortunately, those other 130 or so agencies do not have the ability to do that. Uh, our goal is to get that system set up so when somebody gets run through what's called GCIC, which is our main uh, database we use when we have someone who's arrested and booked into the system, that they will automatically then connect and we can do that. But the reality is today they couldn't do that for most cases because of the limitations put on us by folks in Washington, D.C. Will the Senator further yield? Certainly. What do we need to do as a legislature to make sure those other departments have that capability? That is a great question, Senator. I hope you will join me and everyone else in this chamber by calling all of our federal elected officials, as well as everybody appointed, to give us back the access that we've had before and to make sure that we're taking criminal, illegal aliens off the streets and putting them back to their country of origin where they belong. Thank you. You have another question, Senator. I recognize Senator from the 14th. Thank you, Mr. President. Does Senator yield? Certainly, Senator. I will leave my colleagues to debate other aspects of this bill, but I did want to briefly zero in on the sheriff's response to this bill with you for a second, take a slightly different tack. Um, Senator, would you agree with me that this bill does impose some data collection requirements on the sheriffs and that that is a point of pain for them that they have highlighted for the Senate? Senator, I'm really glad you brought that question up because the sheriffs over the last couple of years have developed a new system that aggregates information from every sheriff's office into a single system. And then for those that don't have that technical capability locally, it allows them to really bring up their, their technology capacity. Uh, with that, they were already in the process of doing a lot of this. Uh, we work with them to extend the date of the bill. That was by their own choice. Uh, but they also know how important this is. Uh, so to add a couple extra fields into the database will take a marginal amount of work. However, uh, again, I think it's uh, uh, very straightforward that they are supporting this bill. Uh, and it's important to note they were not on the original version, and we worked very closely with them to get to a good compromise. Okay, great. And, and what I, I guess, would the Senator agree with me that moving forward, as this body takes up issues of pretrial justice, overcrowding of jails, uh, the way that we charge offenses and hold people, bail issues, would the Senator agree with me that uh, in the future, it would not be an extraordinary lift for the sheriffs to help us out with data in the manner you described so that we could tackle some of those issues uh, with that data in the future? Senator, I will work with you hand in glove to get any amount of additional transparency that we can use to uh, make this a better place to live, work, play, and raise a family. Thanks very much, Thank Senator. Thank you. You have no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll yield the well. The Senator has uh, spoken to the amendment, and we have one person left to speak, and it's the Senator from the 39th or the 7th who's given the minority report. You're getting... You would like, you would like to speak, Senator. All right, Senator from the Seventh, given the minority report. All right. the floor is yours.
Thank you, Mr. President. Today, I rise in opposition to House Bill 1105, titled the Georgia Criminal Alien Track and Report Act of 2024. I understand the emotions attached to this measure. Like everyone in this chamber, I was saddened by the senseless murder of Lake and Riley. And like everyone in this chamber, I hope she received justice. But is it just to punish thousands of other men, women, and children whose only connection to the crime is a shared immigration status with the perpetrator? Is it fair to weaponize our anger towards hardworking people who, like others before them, only seek a better life? Why do the actions of one person require this legislature to act with such impunity? HB 1105 may provide comfort for some in this chamber, but for many of us who are immigrants or American citizens born of immigrant parents, the bill renders us as collateral damage. Some may consider my words hyperbolic or sensational, but let me ask you to my colleagues across the aisle, you are racially an all-white caucus. Has this legislature ever drafted a measure targeting you? House Bill 1105 wages war against immigrants in this state. Of course, others will claim this bill only seeks to deter the presence of criminal illegal aliens. History tells us differently. Aggressive action predicated on anger, fear, and political posturing leads to an unintended consequences, especially for people who look like me. I cannot imagine a Georgia where every city and county law enforcement agency has a memorandum of agreements to enact 287G. There are countless stories about how immigrants, documented and undocumented, chose not to seek help from law enforcement even at the risk of their lives. And considering the stories of how the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services is stretched thin, I find it inconceivable they will have the capacity to support Georgia becoming a 287G state. More so, this bill seems difficult to implement overall. Cities and counties will have to absorb the costs and blame for this clumsy attempt at public safety. HB 1105 claims it will offer, when reasonably possible, granting funding for law enforcement. Then I would ask my colleagues to produce a fiscal note to determine what this display of legislative aggrandizement will cost taxpayers. How much will it cost me so others can feel safe? And to my colleagues in this chamber, be careful what you ask for. The passage of this bill might seem like a victory, but for many, it is a reaffirmation uh, of how immigrants continue to be treated as outsiders in the state and county they love. In addition, this bill will have an impact on law enforcement. Our sheriffs think that the legislature would be overstepping by criminalizing noncompliance with the bill that creates complicated new procedures for a complex area of law. It can take judges and immigration officials years to determine someone's legal status. And this bill attempts to provide a procedure for local law enforcement to do so in just a few pages. The Department of Homeland Security has a budget of $122 billion. They do not need our local law enforcement to do their jobs. And we should not stand in the way of our local law enforcement from doing theirs by sticking them behind a desk to write new reports, agreements, or check documents in the hopes that they can effectively play the role of immig immigration inform enforcement until ICE arrives at their jail. We can and find a better solution to improve public safety, repair our broken immigration system, and protect immigration communities from overzealous policy and enforcement. I urge my colleagues to please vote no on HB 1105. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Senator has yielded. Does any senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Would you like to close the debate, Senator? S senator, how, Senator, actually, you have the the leader there would like to, like to speak. Would you, I'm sure you'd like to speak last, wouldn't you, Senator? Okay. Recognize Senator from 31st.
Thank you, Mr. President. I wasn't planning on getting up here, but I guess I'm going to have to get up here. Um, to my dear friend from the 7th, not to disparage anything you've said, but uh, as someone of Puerto Rican descent, I really do not believe that, hope you do not believe that race is what plays into what you think the decisions of what's best for security or best for this, the community. I will tell you that all the work that I know has gone into this bill, and I'll be one of the first to say the original bill probably wasn't as great as this bill in any way, shape, or form, but our community, Latino community, and I know I've had this debate with the senator from the 6th, so I consider a friend and a brother, um, to stand up in front of this Senate and basically said and say that a, a, a bunch of white people like know better than somebody else on this issue is is honestly despicable and it ain't cool um, the security issues that are going on in our community and across this country are real and I think the state is doing the best that we can do law enforcement is doing the best we can do to basically address these issues and at the end of the day the fault and issue is at the border the fault and the issue is that we are seeing individuals who are released from jail county jails prison going back to venezuela going back to south america and coming back and committing heinous crimes worse than they did in their their home country of origin and we're going to sit here and give the excuse that because the members of the majority party who are all white think they know better? I mean, come on, we're better than that. We are so much better than that. At the end of the day, this is about my kids, your kids, your neighbors, your grandkids, and as much debate, friendly debate, and sometimes tough debate that I've had with my friends in the Latino community and my friend from the six and Representative Marin from Gwinnett County and others, and we have, as we have had this conversation on multiple topics, even the bills we took up last night in the Judiciary Committee that we're going to take up hopefully next week, is to try and find a way to where we all can get to a place that maybe we can agree on this issue that's dividing America at the end of the day. But we cannot, but nobody can come up here and not say that there are dangers and there are security concerns neighborhood to neighborhood. And I know me and my brothers growing up, I mean, we saw an illegal immigrant assassinate a member of our community who was a member of our police department when I was in middle school, who was sitting in a Georgia prison today trying to get out and try and get paroled. This is not new. This has been going on since the 90s and the 80s. But it's so much bigger now because the number of individuals crossing that border is now in the millions. It's not in the hundreds or the tens or whatever it was 20, 30 years ago. It is in the millions. And if we think we're going to sit here and bandage this issue, I commend our law enforcement officers and our jailers and everybody on the front lines having to address this. And honestly, they're at risk. They're at risk because they have to worry about whether or not, you know, they misstep or don't follow procedure or something else and then have to explain that to their family when they're the ones being caught up or maybe eventually prosecuted because they broke the law or a policy or regulation. And I think we're trying to make sure that we're doing everything we can so that it's equal. It ain't perfect, and I expect the minority party to, to vote this bill down. Like, I mean, we know that. But let's not get off base and get off on a tangent and get off the rails here um, for something that is just you know, blatantly not true. And let's rise above it. And if you're going to vote green, vote green. If you're going to vote red, vote red. We already know where everybody stands on this issue. But let's not walk out of here trying to divide us like they do in Washington, D.C., the most broken place in the world, the broken place in America, where they can't even fix the border, which is forcing us to have this debate right now. So keep that in mind as you vote. And hopefully that'll get better. But until then, we have to do what's best for our communities. I know we will continue to have this debate. I hope it's a friendly debate. But let's, let's not get in the gutter to basically go where we're going. Mr. President, I yield the will. Senator's yielded. Does any senator wish to speak for or against the measure?
Chair here is done. I'm going to call on the Senator from 56 to close debate. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to address some of the comments that were made that were uh, wholly inaccurate. We're here to punish criminals. That's what we do. That's why we have a law. We put the bad actors through the criminal justice system, and if they're convicted, they go to jail. And if you are in our country illegally, then you have no business being here anymore. We have a legal immigration system. Most of us, including my family, can trace our roots back to Ellis Island. That's a good thing. To say that we are attacking immigrants is so false. It is actually sensationalizing. We need to focus on being responsible and accountable. It is very sad that we lost some, someone tragically and unavoidably. However, this bill's been worked on for years, folks. It is not new. Also, a reference to 287G was brought up, which again, was sunset by the federal government. The only people that can use that are the handful of agencies that has had it for that long. However, do they need a new system in order to connect us back again so we can get data on those here illegally who are criminals? Yes, they do. And again, a comment from the Sheriff's Association is factually inaccurate and a misrepresentation of the truth. You've got a letter on your desk. The Georgia sheriffs have endorsed this bill. Yes, it's true. The feds are not doing their jobs, and they used to. But we are going to act because here in Georgia, we will protect and serve. We will protect our families, whether Washington helps us or not. And I pray they get their act together and start doing their jobs as well. I hope you light this board up green. I ask for your favorable consideration. I yield the will. Senators yielded. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair, here's none. Previous question is ordered. The question is on the adoption of the amendment number one, authored by the senator from the 56. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendment one is added. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute as amended. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute as amended? Hearing none, the committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of the bill vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 34, the nays are 19. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. Recognize, oh, excuse me, <laughs> House Bill 1193. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 1193. A bill by Representative McDonald of the 22nd, 26th and others, a bill to be entitled act to amend Title 40 of the OCGA relating to motor vehicles and traffic so as to require the operation of flashing or revolving amber lights on certain vehicles and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Transportation recommends that this bill be passed. Respectfully submitted, Senator Dolezal of the 27th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President.
Can I ask the senator from the 29th to speak to the measure? Colleagues, this is a little simple bill that came over from the House from our friends over there. And what it does is it, it has some requirements and some recommendations for certain vehicles as they operate, slow moving vehicles, if you will, school buses, uh, record trucks, escort vehicles that you see carrying mobile homes and other wide loads up and down our highways, requiring them to have the um, rotating uh, amber lights on them. Uh, very simple piece of legislation to make our roads and streets much safer. If there are no questions, Mr. President, I'll yield the well. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the reported committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The reported committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill. All those in favor vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 53, the nays are zero. This bill having received the rest of the Constitution, the majority is therefore passed. Secretary Reed, House Bill 1240. House Bill 1240, a bill by Representative Reeves of the 99th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 11 of the OCGA relating to commercial code so as to update and modernize various state statutes in the commercial code relating to commercial transactions in order to maintain uniformity in the state statutes governing commercial transactions as recommended by the National Conference, Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Judiciary recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the pro tem. Speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, colleagues. Bring to you House Bill 1240. I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Yes, this is one of those boring lawyer bills, but fortunately, it is boring. But it's good. It's one of those necessary evils that we need to engage in every so often to make sure that our code is up to date with how we do business. Uh, this bill is a start to finish update of the Georgia Commercial Code, and the first time we have done this since 2001. HB 1240 was requested by the State Bar's Business Law Section, the UCC Committee, and they were, it was reviewed by a blue ribbon group of Georgia attorneys with extensive experience in corporate law matters from the firms of Parker Hudson, McGuire, Woods, Burr Foreman, Dentons, and Brian Cave. A lot of smart folks have looked into this and thought, what do we need to do as we revise the commercial code? This UCC update is a product of four years of work between 2018 and 2022 at the national level and two years of study right here in Georgia. Ten states have already adopted similar UCC updates. The Georgia Commercial Code has, of course, limited scope. It sets forth the rules for consensual transactions among individuals and businesses. The updated rules will provide greater clarity to Georgia buyers, Georgia sellers, Georgia borrowers, and Georgia lenders on certain topics, 
And that additional clarity will help Georgians maintain the place as a commercial leader. We've got a vibrant economy, and of course, we all like to talk about being the number one state in which to do business. And keeping the up-to-date commercial code is one of the things that will ensure that our laws that go along with that are modern and robust. Um, the bill does several things, but in essence, the act is effective July 1 of 2024, but there is a year to update perfected UCC filings to reflect the new law. Mr. President, that generally does or addresses what the bill does. I'm happy to answer any questions or happy to move on. You have no questions, Senator? Thank you. Thank you for a good positive vote on this. I, I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hearing none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hearing none, the previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the reported committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the reported committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of vote yes. Opposed nay. Secretary unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 52, the nays are one. This bill, having received requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Recognize. Secretary Reed, House Bill 1026. House Bill 1026, a bill rep by Representative Higgin of the 156 and others. A bill to be taught an act to amend Article 3 of Chapter 3 of Title 50 of the OCGA relating to state symbols so as to designate the Southeast Georgia Soapbox Derby as the official soapbox derby of the state of Georgia. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism offers the following substitute to House Bill 1026. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 50 of the OCGA relating to state government so as to provide for economic initiatives in this state to designate the Southeast Georgia Soapbox Derby as the official soapbox derby of the state of Georgia and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the Senator from the 29th. Oh, we got, is this soapbox racing right here, Senator? This isn't a vehicle for something else, is it, Senator? Ain't no, there's no horse racing or anything like that on here, is there, Senator? Thank you, Mr. President. I have been fighting off our good friend from uh, Fulton County for a while. He's been looking for something to add on, a little sports betting, a little gambling. Um, colleagues, as y'all know, when it comes to to betting or gambling, I'm not a supporter. But today I come up here betting that y'all will support this legislation. A lot of work has been done on this legislation from um, our, our friend from the uh, 156th district over in the house. She dropped this legislation last year. It came over and um, I think everybody knows what happened to it. And it also helps our good friend from the 19th bring some economic development and some, uh, some tax dollars to his district. What this is, is this is the Soapbox Derby Bill that um, recognizes the Southeast Georgia Soapbox Derby as the official Soapbox Derby 
um, for the state of Georgia, which started in 1992 in Lyons, Georgia. Um, I'm proud to be from, uh, everybody knows I represent Columbus, along with uh, my friend, Representative Vance Smith from the uh, 138th, along with my good friend, uh, the Dean of the Senate from the 15th, and Columbus is the home of the first national soapbox derby winner. Um, he raced down over there near Airport Three-Way won and went to the Nationals in Ohio and won uh, with a vehicle that had been wrecked and taped back together. And this is a good piece of legislation. I certainly hope you'll support it. But there's an additional piece of this legislation that's extremely important too. For over the last year, um, myself, the senator from the 15th, um, the representative from the 138th, and our dear friend, the former rules chair in the House, have been working with United Way and other economic development groups around middle Georgia, uh, West Georgia, and East Alabama to bring the chip industry to the state of Georgia. And you would be absolutely amazed at the job that these individuals have done. And under the leadership of Chairman Richard H. Smith, um, we took it beyond our imagination. So what we're going to do with this legislation is we're going to create a consortium that will work for the entire state of Georgia. This has been looked at by the Department of Economic Development and that the Georgia Chips and Advanced Technology Consortium will be working with Georgia Tech, the University of Georgia, Georgia State University, Kennesaw State University, University of North Georgia, University of West Georgia, Valdosta State University, Columbus State University, Morehouse College, and Georgia Southern University, along with industry experts to create an environment in the state of Georgia and opportunities in the state of Georgia to recruit and bring microchip manufacturers from around the country and hopefully from outside of the country here to Georgia to manufacture. And to give you an idea how lucrative this industry is, we looked at one business and started working with them and the starting pay in this industry is over $150,000 annually. These are jobs, not 20 jobs, not 30 jobs, but 200, 400, 500 jobs in these industries. So, Mr. President, if there are no questions, I would encourage my friends to vote for this piece of legislation that contains two very important economic development initiatives. One, the microchip industry, and the other one, soapbox derby racing. And with that, with no questions, Mr. President, I'll yield the well. You do have a couple questions, Senator. I recognize the Senator from the 15th. Senator Yale. Yes, sir. As always to the Dean. Thank you, sir. And I just want to ask a question that uh, isn't it true that this represents a huge uh, semiconductor security issue that exists in the United States? And this is one key effort we're doing to try to offset that. Absolutely. The senator knows of which he speaks. And we know during COVID in, in, in my district, which is next to yours, we experienced a, a supply chain shortage of these chips in the automobile industry to the point to where we were having to purchase chips from the washing machine industry in order to have them to put vehicles on the road here in Georgia and beyond. And one final question, Senator Yeo, one more. Is it already true that we've already attracted at least one chip development company to Columbus area? Yes, sir. And I, I try not to smile too much when I think about the potential that rests with that particular company. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dean. And, and again, I want to thank you for your leadership throughout this entire process. You have uh, no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask everyone to vote green, and I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. 
Is there objection to agreeing to the report of committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor vote yay. All opposed nay. Secretary Lamont Michelle. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 49, the nays are 2. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. All right, we're going to do one more bill, and then we're going to break for a late lunch here. But uh, Secretary Reed, House Bill 1312. House Bill 1312. A bill by Representative Jaspers of the 11th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act relating to regulation and taxation of electricity used as motor fuel and electric vehicle charging stations, approved May 2nd, 2023, and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Regulated Industries and Utilities recommends this to be passed by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Kowser of the 46th District Chairman. The Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 1312, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 2 of Title 46 of the OCGA relating to organization and members of the Public Service Commission so as to address the delayed 2022 and 2024 elections for commissioners and maintain staggered elections in terms on the commission and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the senator from the 18th. I know, I know, yeah. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for letting us know we're going to have a break here after this bill, so I'll try not to tarry and keep us too long. As some of you may remember from the news reports back in 2022, uh, a judge issued uh, an order that in essence created an injunction against our Public Service Commission elections. That injunction has stayed in place and is actually in place now. That case was appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and the 11th Circuit set aside in its entirety the ruling of that judge, but there's something called a mandate that comes from the 11th Circuit that then undoes, if you will, the order of the district court. Until that mandate comes down, the injunction is still in place. So what does that mean? That means that when 2022 PSC elections came up, they were stayed. When the 2024 election cycle came up, we missed those too. Now the people that are serving in the PSC continue to serve because our Constitution sa says that those people that are serving in the Public Service Commission, as many other offices, shall continue to serve until their elector or their successor is elected. So we have some 
PSC members that are now serving beyond their initial six-year term. So the question is, how do we go back in and create some, create that schedule that we have always had, if you will, to put that in place so that when the mandate comes back from the 11th Circuit, we will be on a normal, staggered year cycle for electing public service commissioners. The mandate may come down tomorrow. It may come down many, many months from now. But until the mandate comes down from the 11th Circuit, we remain under the injunction. So uh, there's currently uh, no state law that creates a plan for when your elections are missed because that, of course, is something that we don't contemplate in our legislature. Under the plan that's proposed in this bill, um, Georgia will reset the election cycle to ensure that the PSC continues to have staggered elections. If you look at the history of the PSC all the way back to 1906, there's a couple of things that are inherent and embedded in every aspect that is in, that's discussed and what's important with the PSC and the work that it does. One, that members are elected statewide, and two, that their elections are staggered. The reason we want that is because of the work of the PSC thinks about where our state is and where it needs to be many, many years into the future on big issues such as utilities, electric, electrical needs, and so forth. And so staggered elections simply ensures continuity and not quick or unnecessary change of the leadership of the Public Service Commission. So to remain equitable under this proposal, each commissioner will get net two years more onto their terms since Tim Eccles has actually already served eight years instead of six because the judge stayed the elections. District 2 and the special election for District 3 will occur in 2025 in conjunction with municipal general elections. General elections for Districts 3 and 5 will occur in 2026, and the district elections for Districts 1 and 4 will be pushed back to 2028. As I said, our Constitution provides for six-year terms, uh, but the judge has interrupted that, and we simply need to speak as a legislature so that when the mandate comes back, we will have said, this is when we would like our catch-up election cycle to occur and the dates for that. That's all it does. Mr. President, I'm happy to answer questions or I'll yield the well. You do have one question, Senator. Recognize yes. Senator from the 42nd. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Will the gentleman yield? I'll be happy to. Thank you. Um, so. Under this legislation, so I, I understand that the elections are held up by the mandate at the 11th Circuit. So if that mandate were released relatively soon, would it be the case that we could, the Secretary of State could have gone forward with elections but would not under, until this, this, the schedule set out in this new bill? Well, s slight correction, Senator. The, the elections are not held up by the 11th Circuit. The, ele the elections are held up by the district court decision and the injunction that was put in place. The 11th Circuit completely overturned the decision of the district court, but that the mandate that is issued by the 11th Circuit, which then evaporates the district court's ruling, so you go back to status quo, has not been issued. And so we don't know when that's going to happen. It's been, uh, in fact, the decision of the 11th Circuit, Senator, I think was actually issued back in November of last year, um, looking for the date, I think November 24th of 23. So uh, we don't know when the mandate will issue, and we need to speak as a body, as a legislature, and say this is what we would like our catch-up election cycle to look like. Yeah, and thank you for the clarification about the um, successive orders from different courts. But does that mean if the 11th Circuit released us for elections in the next few months, we, could, we would not have them. We would wait for this new schedule? Yes, I think that's, I think that's correct. I think that's correct, that if the mandate comes down, um, then the question is, what is our catch-up election cycle? We're in a weird posture here, quite frankly. I don't know that any legislatures had to deal with this issue because it is highly unusual, as I'm sure you know, you've got experience in election law, very unusual for elections to be indefinitely stayed. So we find ourselves in, a, in the weird position of, what is the remedy for catching up for elections that were missed? We're in this weird cycle, and we're also dealing with an entity that has staggered elections and our constitution and our legislature have spoken and all say staggered elections are a necessary part 
of the work of the PSC. Yes, I, I understand the importance of staggered elections. I'm just a bit concerned because since we already have these holdover terms, as you said, I think one commissioner has already been in there eight years with no election, and this would give them two more years. Well, this in essence pushes everybody back right. for two years. Two more so, years. So that, that way nobody really gets as much of a longer term than anybody else. So just trying to fight, provide some equity and parity in this weird posture that we're in, and it pushes everybody back. But the question is, well, then when should those elections be? And that's what the bill does. It simply provides that structure. Right. And, the, and, so, those, and those actual, excuse me, the actual dates for the elections are prescribed in the bill. Right. So it would give everyone essentially eight-year terms. In essence, net-net. In essence, net. Not, which is a really long not, time. Not exactly, but in essence. <laughs> which is an amazingly long time. And well, but, but not by anything we did wrong, not by anything anyone requested. It's just this odd posture that we're in. Understood on that. This has I, been thrust upon us, if you will. Completely understand on that point. My, my question is, given how extraordinarily long these terms already are, even before this bill, and the lack of elections, if we were able to hold an election sooner, why would, wouldn't it be in the interest of, of the voters of Georgia to allow them to vote on this very important body as soon as possible? Well, the problem is, I don't think we can draft a bill, Senator, that says let's hold an election as soon as possible. Um, as you know, statutes prescribing election protocols, election dates, and election methods have to be very particular, right? So that the Secretary of State's office is, in for, is complying with our laws and enforcing something of a very particular nature. That's why it has to be a date. Second, I think if you look, I think that's in essence what this does because this provides that, this, that the soonest dates under the revised schedule is the municipal court election for 2025, which I think, Senator, is actually in May of next year. And since we're not going to be back after next Thursday, good Lord willing, uh, until early 25, um, this sets that structure and provides that stability. Thank you. You have no further questions, okay. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge you to uh, let's pass this legislation. Let the legislature speak on how we have a prescribed schedule for the makeup time for having these, these PSC elections. And I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Recognize Senator from the 50th. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, I rise in support of this legislation. I want to thank the senator from the 18th for bringing this. Um, we didn't want to be in this situation. A federal judge essentially canceled two election cycles. Um, and we're waiting on a mandate. That could be issued tomorrow. That could be issued six months from now. Like the pro tem said, in a couple days, we're not gonna be down here to make these changes. So what this is essentially is just a pathway for the judge to follow. Um, now the judge could ignore the legislature. He could ignore state law, but this would at least put in place a pathway for him to follow. We hope he will follow it and we'll get our elections uh, back on the correct cycle. So that, Mr. President, I ask for everybody's uh, consideration and favor for this bill. Thank you. I yield the will. Senator is yielded. Senator from 26, would you like to speak to the bill? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, Mr. President, is this bill giving uh, Public Service Commission eight-year terms? No, sir. I think it's just staggering the... Uh, it's staggered, but uh, do they have eight-year terms or four-year terms? Six-year terms, I believe Six it years. is, Senator. Right. And that's what it's currently is right now. If you want to amend it to get you six-year term, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other senator would speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objections to previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Question is on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the board of committee, which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The board of committee is agreed to. 
Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair here is done. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 43, the nays are 9. This bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed by substitute. All right, let's break uh, standing stand recess for a little bit. I know it's a little late for lunch, but I do think, uh, okay. I think the pro tem majority leader do have food provided for you there. So let's break for my lunch. Uh, be back here in about... Be back here in about an hour, about 4.30, and uh, see if we can't get through some of this, this calendar. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The pro tem will be serving dinner later on this evening. Later on this evening. He's got, he's got a special, special thing going on with peanuts in there, though, y'all can have. So. No, but you have, you have an hour to go uh, grab you something real quick. But the pro tem will be uh, having dinner for everyone tonight. So. All right, take a little break. We'll be back at about 4.30. Thank you.